Welcome back, everyone, the Cube's live coverage in Las Vegas. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube with Dave Vellante. We're here with SAS at SAS Innovate 2024. We're back with two great guests, Brian Harris, Chief Technology Officer of SAS, Marinella Profi, Global Product Marketing Strategy for AI and Janae, both stage performers today on the keynote. Brian, Marilyn, thanks for coming on theCUBE again. Great hey to guys. see you. Thanks for How having you us. Great to be here. So we were just at your event last year. We said, you said some things, put some things out there. Yeah. This is what we're going to do with AI. Generative AI was all the hot, hot rage. Chat GPT, real innovates on the user interface. Check, we see that. Getting things done is a whole nother ball game. You guys got some huge announcements. The models, I love it. Let's just get into what's going on right now. What's the key things for your transformative technology around Gen AI? Well, let's, let's, let's just get to generative AI out of the gate, because everyone's talking about it, huffing and puffing, everyone's, you know, <laughs> which is, again, yeah. it's a really exciting technology, but it has to be put in context to actual business outcomes. And so, uh, I think, for me, I'd like to actually give it over to Marinelle a little bit, because you know, she's a day-to-day -day data scientist out yeah. there, and on the ground, meeting with customers, hearing the feedback. And so, Marinelle, why don't you talk about um, why don't you talk about what you're seeing on, on the ground? Absolutely, ground. thanks Brian. Yeah, so from my perspective, I mean, I'm a data scientist, and I think the, the number one lesson that I've learned, and if there, if there is a lesson that I've learned over well, the past year and a half has been, LLMs, large language models alone, do not solve business problems. Like, this technology is so cool, and no matter how cool it is, it's still imperfect, and it's all going to come down to solving real world business problems for specific industries and specific people, right? We're seeing a lot of companies just saying, we have this technology, let's go and build it. Let's see, and here's how we're going to do it. So a lot it's around how do we build something, but that there is very little around why. Why are we even building it? Who's going to use, who's going to serve, like what's the value that's going to deliver, right? And so for me, from my perspective, uh, what, what I've been seeing is that, you know, generative AI and large language models in this case are like the 20% of the entire yeah, yeah value chain, if you, if you consider a real world use case. And I think, you know, what Brian shared today with Georgia Pacific was an incredible yeah. example of that. I don't know if you want to add yeah, more. Yeah, definitely. I mean, good, good case in point, right? That, you know, Georgia Pacific is on stage talking about their use of Assess Via as part of our generative AI workflow. I mean, it, there is a lot of moving parts and there, and there is no more um, kind of validated feedback on a production use case of Gen AI when you're, they're actually trying to run their plant, like right? their plant operations is yeah. leveraging generative AI and as part of that, they're getting corrective actions through this generative AI experience that is leveraging SAS via to orchestrate across LLMs, orchestrate across quantitative reasoning needs for, uh, we're, we're interacting with enterprise systems, so all yeah. of this orchestration's happening, ultimately to give a human language response back to an operator who is three, five years experience in their job, and they're trying to convert them and upskill them to a seven, you know, five to seven year employee. There were a yeah. lot of components to that stack. Yes. You think you get you know, a picture of it here. You, yeah. got, you had Bedrock <laughs> on there, you, yeah. had, you had SageMaker, you had SAS, you had yeah. another couple other, other pieces, yeah. and so you see, you see Gen AI as the orchestrator it, yeah, of for all us, that. <clears throat> at some point, you got to integrate all of the tech, and the, what you're really getting to is you're making a final decision to give a response back to a user. And as we know, the, the, the kind of the, a lot of the use cases right now are very shallow. They're just you know, prompt engineering to an LLM and come back. Yeah. And like, and yes, rag architectures are there, but yeah. we got to get things done in you know sub-second response time mm -hmm. here. Yeah. So there's very, very challenging integration and expectations of responses from generative AI workflows yeah. that we have to get done. So for us, Via sits at the center of that, and even you know uh, Sam Coyne mentioned it today that we really bring all of these things together. We can you know augment prompts, we can orchestrate against other traditional models and things like that and bring that data back in so that the LLM can reason over that and send back the response back to the, to the user, so. And answering to your question, I think VIA is the orchestration here, not generative AI. Generative AI is a piece that can augment existing processes and our VIA, our data and AI platform, functions as that orchestration of the entire yeah. decisioning flow and that's exactly what we're announcing today. Yeah. We've extended VIA yeah. to allow developers to use our API to govern, orchestrate, mm. and build real world use cases with Gen AI. And I think the point about Gen AI is an element of the stack, was at the higher end of the yeah. stack. I have a picture, I want to just your, get your reaction. Okay, you built on AWS, so got some hardware, yeah. got some cloud. There you go. SaaS uh, intelligent decisioning, that's your layer, yeah. right? That's the- Decisioning system. Decisioning systems, and then multiple real-time data, knowledge bank, yeah. process model. Okay, that's the meat and potatoes, that's the, that's the stuff that's the key yeah. jewels to, to make that thing yeah. work. And, and then you got the GNI on top managing it, and then you got the outcomes. Yeah, and so like, yeah, so you think of it as that something has to 
bring all these things together because right now a lot of the reasoning capabilities in text for LLM is around you know, textual fact-based yeah. reason responses. But a lot of the decisions in the enterprise are yeah. quantitative. So that's why we pride ourselves on bringing, being the quantitative reasoning engine inside of gen generative AI workflows. And intelligent decisioning is such a flagship product for us because it allows us to, in, we can bring four or five different models to actually integrate across text, across the LLM itself, across the actual enterprise systems yeah. we're integrating with. I want to connect it to something you said in the media briefing, if I could, which is about ROI. I mean, yeah. if you look at how people are using Gen AI today, it's very chat GPT-ish. Yes. You know, so it's not literally blowing away the, the cash flows. I mean, it's just, it's not really paying for itself. And so, when you start talking about these industry-specific models, that's where you're going to get return. And people are pushing out their ROI expectations based on the surveys that 100%. we have, right? And so, you know, they're being a little bit more conservative because they're saying, okay, this is fun, this is cool, but yeah. we need real dollars. Well, when you open up a prompt to thousands of people in your organization, <laughs> the quality of your questions is now your biggest concern, yeah. right? And you now said. people are paying for this. Yeah. So now, okay, well that's why you saw us talking about stored prompts. Yeah. Because yeah. our ability to say, all right, mm -hmm. look, there's not an infinite set of questions like in the public domain with like ChatGPT. Right? In an enterprise, there's a finite set of questions. So why don't we understand those questions you want to ask make an inventory of those, use VIA to kind of do the yeah. semantic yeah. analysis on this, to then say, when three, four people ask a question, we're going to get the question, that the right question you're asking, yeah. and then let that then drive, uh, reduce the error to yeah. the LLM, reduce the error to the vector database, reduce yeah. the error to the quantitative uh, reasoning with VIA as well. That, I thought that was a very nuanced point. I thought that one of the things that jumped out at me was the stored prompts, oh. because you know, Dr. Goodright was actually bragging about the compiler versus the interpreter on yeah. stage. <laughs> if you think about that, as you get smarter with these stored prompts, you can learn, and that's like compiling away the LLM risk. Yeah. Yep. You, know, so, what's, what we, you know what's funny about it? It's if you remember, um, what do database providers want to do? They wanted stored procedures. Yeah. yeah. Right. And stored procedures was their way to govern the way to build uh, optimized queries for databases. Yeah. So stored prompts are really just an extension yeah. of that entire Pe model. People are doing this in all kinds of use cases to get smarter. You make a prompt, you get an answer, you come back. This comes back down to the architecture. Why I like that graph and why I called it out was that's a production workload. Yes. Okay. Correct. There was no. The only thing that's outside there is the customer's environment, Amazon, and your SaaS stuff. So, yeah. So that brings up the kind of the big picture here. You got training and inference is the big discussion on how to yep. deal with data, and then you got prompt response, and then you got reasoning in the AI paradigm, okay, yeah. all contextual and behavioral. So you're essentially rolling all that up. So, okay, prompt response, that could be real like IO. Yeah. Reasoning could take a little longer, maybe, or, yeah. so I got to run that somewhere. How do you see that, that applying to known end-to-end -end workloads? Because this is the theme that's popping into this AI world in the enterprises. Mm -hmm. I got known workloads. I can yeah. scope them, yeah. I can qualify them. I, I think the way, it, the way it rolls up is that we're seeing, the emer de definitely the agent design pattern is emerging. In fact, in our Viacopilot right. pilot demo yep. that Marinella was showing today, we're actually doing some iterative uh, work where we have one generating the code, right? One, one, one part of the orchestration is generate the code underneath it, execute the code, if it fails, tell the LM yeah. it failed, it'll make the corrective action on yeah. it and execute it again. And then we'll yeah. get the actual, you know, no, human. Uh, no human in that one. Yeah. And then that's why you saw like a map come on the screen, yeah. or you saw some of the extra follow on visuals or suggestions. So we're, that's why this orchestration is so important because yeah. it really is an iterative yeah. process. It's not a single request, single response yeah. experience. Right. And so yeah. for us, this reasoning thing, if you think of reasoning, reasoning has to span, you know, text-based, fact-based things, media like yeah. images and, and video. And, but most importantly, in the enterprise, quantitative reasoning is really the majority of the workload challenge. It's not about just, yeah. you know, I mean, customer service, yes. I got a knowledge base, I can give you answers on it. Right. But a lot of the enterprise class problems are, how do I look yeah. at numbers, analyze numbers, and make a recommendation on the next best action? And, and that's whatever. why I asked that dumb question in the, in the media thing. That was not a dumb not question, a dumb okay, question. That wasn't a dumb okay. question. Well, I was trying to get, I came out I've wrong. I've seen a lot dumber okay. questions than that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm usually yeah. known for dumb questions. Yeah. The, but the a whole bag of them over here. <laughs> but, but the point is, customers today have to go to different models for different modals. Yes. Oh. So they want one place. Yeah. They want to have the reasoning and all this. It sounds complicated, but if you put it in one place, you can do vector embeds for unstructured data, yes. I can bring a table in, I can bring in a DNA sequence, yes. that's a mode, right? I mean, yeah. all kinds of data can be 
structured that way if it's in one place. I yeah. don't want to go five different places. And then do you have the technology, right. I think, that you can talk about. Why don't you yeah. give the example of the yeah. banking one we talked about Correct. today. Correct, yeah. Where, where you can really talk about all the tasks that were required to really make it work. Yeah, so this is one example that we were working with a global bank where they had, they were doing complaints management, right? It's, it's a simple use case, like mm -hmm. it's not revolutionary, but like the question was, how can I augment what I'm doing with generative AI, with large language models? And, the, you know, the, the integration of the LLMs is not just easy as, oh, give ChatGPT the complaint and generate a summary, and then based on that, oh, ask to generate a, a reply to the customer and send that reply to the customer. Like, that's not how it actually would work because you have so many other pieces in the middle. And in this case, the flow that the developers was, were able to build to actually productionalize that use case involved other things like, okay, the summary is generated by the LLM, but how do you explain if that's accurate? How do you explain how you generate that summary? And so that's where natural language processing techniques, which is actually a method that, that has been proving to be really critical and fundamental in explaining some of these, uh, the, the output generated by large language models, so that's, and then how do you in integrate your customer data within that summary. The LLM doesn't know if your customer is a, has a high credit score, is a good payer, is not a good payer, like the credit, those are your enterprise data. The LLM, does, and unless you want to give that to the LLM and expose them to the LLM, which I don't think are, that, that's what our customers are asking to, you need that dis quantitative decisioning engine that augments it, it, that information and sends back that information for the LLM to actually generate them that summary and to generate that email in a, in a more reasoned and, and a way that I makes mean, sense. Collect, I mean, if you think about it, we compress all the complexity of the quantitative side into a much more consumable um, right. fact that can be presented back to the yeah. LLM, so we can use its strengths which yeah. is to generate right. natural language which, So that might be a score, for example? Yeah. Or, okay, yes. yeah. Yeah. and then the LLM will take that score, score. So, as opposed to trying to generate the score, which yeah. it's not good at. It's right. actually horrible at exactly. that. Exactly, that's, that's exactly horrible. You said it well. <laughs> right. I would say it exactly that way, it's terrible. Dave, he's, yeah. he's, yeah. He's, a, he's, a, he's a SaaS user in our, <laughs> so, yeah, well, well, actually, I, that, used to program in SaaS. Yeah, when we were back in the, that wasn't back in the day. We appreciate it. Back in the day. I was born in For those about the prop, we salute you. Yeah. <laughs> if your customer is complaining about your credit your, your service, the LLM is not going to be able to generate the next back action for your specific customer because doesn't know your customer, doesn't know, yeah. uh, you know, doesn't right, know what next back action is. All right, since you're a customer, I want to get more use case information, what you guys see in the marketplace. As you know, Dave and I always talk when Dave does some research on the monetization, because that's really going to be the yeah. scoreboard. Are you, is it adopted in production, which you guys have shown some examples, some great yeah. and others, and the monetization of AI, see the, the early adopters, some are monetizing really well, so that's also a tell sign. Monetization, uptake, and then customer success. So, so and you mentioned you're doing well with the, with the business performance, yeah. and you spent a billion dollars of investment and spending more on the tech, so you got tech investment and monetization, good job. What what are the unit economics look like? What's the use cases that are emergent you can point to and say, we're starting to see the, the things line up in the market, the fog's lifting in the enterprise. What, what is it out there and, and how is it being monitored? Yeah, beyond the chit chat, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll get yeah. there. I mean, I would say that we hear a lot of customers worried about another yet another metered uh, challenge to the business. Yeah. I mean, there are CFOs saying, I, look, we got, we're trying to run a profitable business and, I, and look, if you can, you can tolerate metered billing when you know you've got enough room on the financials to tolerate, tolerate it, but when you start to lower, remember, we're lowering the barrier to interaction for data and AI across the entire enterprise. When you do that, you're actually encouraging usage of these metered services, which is fine, but you have to make sure that the use cases yeah. are driving an ROI that can sub support those metered uh, interactions. And, yeah. and then we have other customers are saying, can, can you take me off the meters? Can we just run? It's my Somebody, data, I want to bulk up a little bit, it's my own data. Yeah, yeah, exactly, so I don't, you know, can I, so we have, and we want to respect all of those, right? Many customers who, they want to, you know, we're partnered with Microsoft, we want to use, leverage their open AI services where possible. We're working with Bedrock and Amazon and AWS, we'll do that, yeah. but there are customers who are like, hey, I want to run with Mistral. Like, I want to go and I want to run that yeah. in a GPU that's hosted in their environment. Uh, so the same cloud spend conversation that was really... So they want optionality, but they want to have confidence on what the spend's going to look like. They yeah, need absolutely. To have some scope. Yes, because what's happening is everyone, again, the FOMO that was happening around just go run to this thing is now being uh, realized in the financial outcomes of these B businesses. These are big customers? I mean, can they get GPUs? I mean, if you're not spending I mean, 10 million bucks yeah. on, on it, NVIDIA, it, you, yeah, it, you, you No, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think when you're training models, it's one thing, yeah. right? If you're just looking to go and do the uh, hosting and some scoring of these models, I think it's, yeah. there's options there, right? There's, yeah. there's a lot of things coming down in size on it. Now, we're, we're just going to make sure that our stuff can react to any one of these scenarios. Like, can it, if we want to use a cloud service provider, we're happy to do it. 
Right. Some of the customers just want, that's what they want to do, so of course. we'll leverage it. But we're seeing others now starting to say, it, let's bring it local. Is it well. tracking like DevOps did? You get a use case and you experiment with something, or is it end-to-end yeah. -end workflows that are emerging? What are, what are some or of is the, it the data I, is on? I, I think know? first of all, I think there's a little bit of a hammer and nail problem where everyone's saying, let's start with generative AI, when that really, Correct. generative AI yeah. is a subset of AI. It's not a superset of AI, which is a big problem, because it's been presented in the market as if like generative AI is this new, thing, it's actually a subset of the larger AI umbrella. In fact, the problems being solved by the rest of the AI space are much larger than the problems being solved by the LLM yep. and generative AI space. So, and some of the best models are small. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I so. think the, 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 that's going to be the future. Where, where the smaller, yeah, yeah. Small smaller language models. Small, are, yeah, yeah, smaller language models, that would say almost auto fine tune themselves yeah. And for specific industries and specific use cases are going to be the And that's future. because they're totally more agree. accurate and faster, or? or well, I think it's like anything else. If you go to the public, right, the, the, the large language models that are out in the public are just, um, just they, they, they're kind of generalists, right, in these things. Oh. And they're powerful for very many reasons. But they get vanilla. Right, exactly. <laughs> so if you, if you want to use an example here, and I, you know, I mean, Google was trying to, to, remember when Google was so huge, they wanted to get into the enterprise space, right? How can we put that Google engine? People are going home, and they were having a Google experience, right, for search, and they would go into the business and say, why can't I have that same search experience in my business? <laughs> the use case was different, yeah. right? Yeah. Google's yeah. indexing engine was about finding information authorities. Meanwhile, in the business, it was about quantitative analysis. So they never could really penetrate that market. We're having the same challenge now with, with generative AI, which is that you can have a very public domain question and answer experience with LLMs that are very powerful, and you want that capability on the enterprise, but there's more work to be done, and what people are realizing now is how much more work there is to be done, especially for us, we're in regulated industries, so we can't yeah. be wrong. Yeah. Wow. So I can't just go and you know, run. Uh, can't wing it. Yeah, can't wing it. Yeah. We've got to go and work meticulously with them to understand, yeah. here's what happens when you do this response. And if that response gives an answer and you need proof of it, there, yeah. There's we, no need, space for we need lineage, you yep. need all the yeah. things that go behind it. No space for hype for us. And what I would add is also that, I mean, my question is, until what point this gigantic large language models providers are actually realistically going to have data to keep training these huge models? Yeah, yeah. They're like, try to, meaning they're going to run out of data. They are. I, it's, called, I think so. it's called strip I mining. Think so. I think that's And even if it's because, even is, either is because it's going to become a legal issue, yeah. or a point where you can't take my data anymore to try and whatever you want to train, or there's just no more data, so we have to go back to synthetic data. Can you believe data we're generate. saying that? I know. This, we're running data. data. Adobe, Adobe is charging seven dollars, I think, a minute yeah. for the yeah. for the video, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and that's why Data Maker for us is the big announcement. Correct. Because SAS Data Maker for us allows us to attack the structured, the yeah. gap in structured data for um, synthetic data. And yeah. by being able to do that, we can go into regulated spaces yeah. and give proof to the statistical congruence of yeah. synthetic data yeah. that can bootstrap models yeah. that yeah. will allow them to run effectively on real world data. You got to have explainable AI, yeah. table stakes, and, yeah. and security built in. Great, great to have you guys on, we're out of time. Final gotta question. Go? Yeah, oh. they got the hard oh, stop. That, well, I, was, I was enjoying this. Well, we got, we got, I'll wow. get one more question yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on, we got one more. Maybe two So more. next, great, great step up from last yeah. event. Thank yeah. you for bringing all the goods to the table. Next year when we're sitting here, yeah. what are we going to be talking about? What's going to be the big discussion? Brian, we'll need to t t share your thoughts. We'll start with Brian. Yeah, and I, we'll I, I think that what we're about to achieve with App Factory, right, we're still, we're building our own solutions with it, but the productivity of that thing is incredible. When we start wrapping some generative AI experiences on building applications that are, the treatment on that's going to be incredible. I think what you're going to see on our Via Copilot's work yeah. that we've just done and demonstrated today, I mean, the ability for our Via Copilot's to be a very practical approach to the AI lifecycle is, I think it's going to be world, it's world class and second to none. So I, that's where I think I'm where we're at. What I am really excited about is to continue, so the strategy that we have taken over the past year now, two years, is to have purpose, like building something with a purpose, right? And I'm really excited to come and see that come in action. Like we're not just yeah. a startup that is going around what, looking for funds from, from, from a VC. We're building these things for actually being used in the world and creating real yeah. world value. And I can't wait for that to, to continue to be and have even more, yeah. like I want to come here next year and talk about other 10 customers yeah. that we've done and how, all the models that we're going to sell. Hey, and so he, that to me, what I'm yeah. really excited that about. That billion dollars in investment, you're monetizing well, which was proof, yes. and you got yeah. production workloads. Yeah. I mean, just keep keep it coming. Yes, I, and I would say too, we have a we will have a significant amount of progress on 
penetrating the market with selling our models, which we're really excited about. I, I got to ask one more question. Yeah, I good. think we got time. Ask for forgiveness. Forgive. You, <laughs> yeah, you, you said in the media briefing, nobody's looking at the impact of AI the way SaaS is. Yeah. And, and today it's very clear. You, you're talking about very focused on solving a lot of business problems. How far out are you looking? I mean, oh, what do you mean by that? In terms of the impact of AI. AGI, if we have AGI oh. by the end of the decade, I mean, are you thinking Robots. that far out? Uh, and, and then if you think about exponential growth of computational power, yeah. mid-century, I mean, this, <laughs> when you make that statement, I have to ask you, like literally, how far yeah. out are you thinking? Is I, I it think more? That we're, I think we'll have tools that we'll be able to evaluate, we'll have capabilities that can evaluate the real reality of these models. I mean, some of these models are self-fulfilling, you know, uh, validations where it's like th there's no real, I mean, they're not deterministic, right? So there's like certain kind of workloads we put against them, we try to measure them on grading these things, but they're not measured on the enterprise's actual workloads. So how do we think about what does the answer look like in an enterprise and how did that model react to it? And then being able to go and say that worked, that didn't work, it starts bringing some true um, in customer validation endpoints to what are we doing with generative AI? So, I mean, I think that's, that's the area where you'll start seeing where these things will have to be validated independently of the model creators. Well, the stars of the show, you're in high demand, you got to go, we're getting the hook, you got to leave it there. Okay, Sorry. we're going to continue the conversation here on theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We'll be right back.